Okay, good evening. We are here for the next live reading. And, of course, once again, I forgot to turn on my captions. Oh, there they are. Good. All right. So, um, getting into our second article in Forbidden History. This one is about creation versus evolution. Um, and just to give y'all uh, kind of a sense of what creation. The third one um, is exposing a scientific cover-up. Um, so it's going to be a little bit of a, an excerpt from Forbidden Archaeology, which is a book I am reading and have been reading for a couple of years because it's, uh, it's a monstrously huge book and it's really dry reading. Uh, so it's been difficult to get through, uh, but very interesting and informative at the same time. So uh, part two, that takes us into part two, um, making the case for catastrophism, uh, earth changes sudden and gradual. So the net, so then there will be one, two, three, four, five, six articles that are somehow related to that part three is exploring the greater antiquity of civilization and there will be um, seven articles in that then searching for the fountainhead is part four and it looks like nine articles there yeah um but we may be doing more than one article uh, uh an evening um the first reading I did the introduction and one article. I think it's possible we can we can fit in two. Just depends on how well my voice holds out. Okay. So let's jump into the second article here, which is Evolution versus Creation is the Debate for Real by David Lewis. So <clears throat> excuse me. Genesis, the biblical story of creation, tells us that God created the universe in six days. He made Adam the first man, the Bible, uh, first man, the Bible tells us, from the dust of the earth. An event many Christians believe took place in the Garden of Eden 6,000 years ago. Scientists and religious scholars call this scenario creationism. I suppose I should put this on the chat screen, although that just gives you a bigger picture of my ugly mug but hey you came here to see me <laughs> right uh, anyway in 1859 Charles Darwin came up with another idea he, he said man's existence could be explained within the context of material cr creation alone through evolution and natural selection, that is, the survival of the fittest, which I mentioned last time is not a direct uh, quote from uh, Darwin. He never actually said survival of the fittest. It's just how people have boiled down his idea into the uh, a, a one-liner. Um, but anyway, according to Darwin, man evolved from the apes an idea distinctly at odds with the biblical scenario the debate over human origins has raged ever since it it surfaced recently in abbotsford british columbia where a school board dominated by christians requires the teaching of intelligent design a form of creationism along with the theory of evolution reports uh Reports McLean Magazine, quote, The issue they are debating is a large one. Arguably, the biggest question of them all, how did life begin? With a big bang or a big being? End quote. Critics of the Abbotsford policy fear the school board would place the book of Genesis on a par with Darwin's origin of species. They accuse the board of imposing their religious beliefs on students, while some Christians believe that teaching Darwinism amounts to the same thing, the imposition of a de facto religious belief system. 
something to be said about that. Recent studies show, however, that adherence on uh, to both sides of this. Wow, some of these sentences are are kind of adherence to both sides of this wrangle would do well to rethink their positions. A re-examination of old and new research reveals that the creationism versus Darwinism debate may be missing the mark entirely. Richard Thompson and Michael Cremo, co-authors of Forbidden Archaeology and its condensed version, The Hidden History of the Human Race, have assembled a body of evidence that testifies to the existence of modern men millions of years before this, before his supposed emergence from southern Africa 100,000 years ago. On The Mysterious Origins of Man, an NBC documentary that aired in February of 1996, Thompson and Cremo make their case along with other experts. The evidence they reveal suggests man neither evolved from apes nor rose from the dust of the earth just 4,000 years before the time of Christ. The implications are profound and may force a reevaluation of the entire issue of human origins. Narrated by Charlton Heston and drawing on evidence largely ignored by the scientific establishment, the mysterious origins of man steps outside the usual Bible versus Darwin debate. At issue are human footprints discovered in Texas side by side with dinosaur tracks, stone tools dating back 55 million years, sophisticated maps of unknown antiquity, and evidence of advanced civilization in prehistory. Based on research assembled as Darwin began to dominate scientific thought at the turn of the 19th century and also upon more recent archaeological discoveries, the mysterious origins of man exposes a knowledge filter within the scientific establishment, which is a lot of what the book Forbidden Archaeology is about. A bias that favors accepted dogma while rejecting evidence that does not support conventional theory. As a result, fossil evidence indicating that man is far more ancient than conventional theory allows and that he Hey, salty little dude. Thank you for the raid. I just started the reading. Um, I'm only a page into it. Um, as a result, fossil evidence indicating that man is far more ancient than convenient, conventional theory allows and that he did not evolve from apes has gathered dust for over a century. It has been suppressed in, in effect because it conflicts with an entrenched belief system. The NBC documentary reveals, <clears throat> excuse me, moreover, scientists who challenge accepted dogma can find themselves not only on the outside of the debate, but also unemployed. Thompson, the science investigator, Richard Milton, and other experts trace the problem to, quote, speculative leaps, end quote, made by researchers too eager to find the missing link in human evolution the long sought after ancestor of both man and apes quote it seems any missing link will do end quote uh milton says regarding the 120 year effort to prove darwin's theory in the case of the so-called pithecanthropus ape man aka java man homo erectus the anthropologist Eugene Dubois found in Indonesia a human thigh bone and the skull cap of an ape separated by a distance of 40 feet. The year was 1891. He pieced the two together, creating the famous Java man. But many experts say the thigh bone and skull cap are unrelated. Shortly before his death, Dubois himself said the skull cap belonged to a large monkey and the thigh bone to a man. Yet Java man remains to this day to many evidence of man's descent from the apes, having been featured as such in New York's Museum of Natural History until 1984. Welcome, everyone. I see we've got six people in right now. Awesome. In the case of Piltdown Man, another missing link wannabe, this one 
discovered in England in 1910, the found the find proved to be a sophisticated fraud perpetuated in all likelihood by overly zealous Darwinists. And even the crown of alleged human ancestral fossils, the famous Lucy, found in Ethiopia in 1974, is indistinguishable from a monkey or an extinct ape, according to many anthropologists. That's actually the part I'm reading in Forbidden Archaeology right now, uh, which is, it's it's interesting. Is it's, it's um, I don't know if I want to read that book on this channel. It's, like I said, it is monstrous. It's 750 pages of some of the driest reading you'll ever read in your life. Um, and that's not including 75 pages of appendices. And I'm on page 742 right now. So <laughs> I've been reading in it for three years. It's taken me to get that far. Um, okay. Uh, the physical anthropologist Charles Oxnard and other scientists have drawn a picture of human evolution that is radically at odds with the conventional theory, a fact usually ignored by universities and natural history museums. Oxnard places, placed the genus Homo, to which, humans, to which man belongs, ugh, uh, in a far more ancient time period than standard evolutionary theory allows bringing into question the underpinnings of Darwin's theory. As reported in Cremo and Thompson's Forbidden Archaeology, Oxnard says, quote, The conventional notion of human evolution must now be heavily modified or even rejected. New concepts must be explored, end quote. What pains other opponents of standard evolutionary theory is its inability to account for how new species and features originate. The, supp the supposition that the innumerable aspects of biological life, down to the pores in human skin and a beetle's legs and the protective pads on a camel's knees, came about accidentally through natural selection. The notion of intent or inherent purpose within creation does not fit into the Darwinism version of reality. Life to a Darwinist can exist only in the context of absolute materialism, a series of accidental events and chemical reactions that are responsible for everything in the universe. Even common sense seems to take a backseat to scientific dogma. In the case of the human brain, for instance, its advanced capacity, the ability to perform calculus, play the violin, even consciousness itself, cannot be explained by the survival of the fittest doctrine alone. I kind of had a fig feeling this book this article is going to get in a lot into kind of the intelligent design theory and i've read books on it i took a whole um class on it in anthropology degree and there's a uh, some good points to the theory but um there's a whole lot missing too um, and if I can find any of the textbooks I had during that class, I might have some in storage. If I can find any, I might read one of them here just to um, kind of give you all an idea if you haven't studied intelligent design. The creationist argument derives from orthodox religious doctrine, rejecting allegorical and metaphorical interpretations of the book of Genesis. It is a belief system many Christians do not accept literally, and which the Bible itself may not support. It also lacks scientific support in that fossil records reveal that man has existed on earth for far longer than 6,000 years. The six days of creation scenario Moreover, taken literally, bears no resemblance to the time it took for the universe to be born. The more common sense notion of intelligent design, creationism without the dogma, strikes a more palatable, palatable note until you actually study it. Um, even among some scientists who find it hard to deny that an inherent intelligence exists within the universe, the problem with creationism lies then not in the idea of intelligent design, but in its dogmatic and inflexible interpretations of the Bible with regard to the debate over human origins. And one of the biggest problems I have with intelligent design, just while we're on the subject, is that it absolutely 100% takes 
the Christian view as the one and only possible view, which is complete bullshit. There are many, many religions in the world, and just because your religion says it's the only one or the only true one doesn't mean it's right. Every religion can have that viewpoint, and none of us can actually know which is the one and only true religion. Just because a, a book says so doesn't, doesn't mean it is so. Anyway. <clears throat> New ground or ancient wisdom. Evidence for extremely ancient human origins will lead many into foreign territory, terrain some would rather avoid. But to others, the standard creationism versus evolution debate was wanting all along. One upon with raised eyebrows and still facing dogged opposition, the catastrophist point of view has made headway of late in the scientific community. This theory holds that sudden disruptions in the continuity of planetary life have taken place, altering the course of evolution. Gradualism, on the other hand, a Darwinist tenet that assumes all life evolved slowly and without interruption, has fallen out of favor in some circles. Indeed, it has become clear that all sorts of catastrophes have taken place on the globe and in the universe at large. A well-known catastrophist theory proposes that the extinction of the design, the dinosaurs, ugh, sorry, resulted from a huge meteor crashing into the planet with a force of thousands of hydrogen bombs. Other cata catastrophic theories have to do with, sorry, lost my place. Other catastrophic theories have to do with drastic changes in climate, seismic upheavals and fluctuations, and even reversals in Earth's magnetic field. The catastrophism versus gradualism debate will, while revealing how little science knows for certain about prehistory, also exposes a distinct prejudice within the scientific community and antipathy uh, dating to the time of Darwin toward anything remotely resembling biblical catastrophes, such as the Great Flood, even if the connection has to do only with sudden rather than gradual changes in the course of evolution. Catastrophism, though, uh, avails another scenario regarding human origins in history. As presented in Graham Hancock's Fingerprints of the Gods, the Evidence of Earth's Lost Civilization, and in Rand and Rose Flemath's When the Sky Fell in Search of Atlantis, a sudden catastrophic shifting of the Earth's lithosphere, called crustal displacement, may have occurred at some time in the past. Lent Credibility by uh, Albert Einstein, the theory suggests that the Earth's outer crust may have suddenly, not gradually, as in continental drift, shifted on the surface of the globe, causing continents to slide into um, radically different positions. I wonder if that's part of how they um, theorize Pangaea came apart or... Lemuria sank another if you're not familiar with that I'm sure we'll get into a book on that eventually um, drawing on the work of Charles Hapgood who developed the theory with Einstein's assistance the phlegm aths explained that this may be the reason carcasses of hundreds of woolly mammoths rhinos and other ancient mammals were found flash frozen in a zone of death across Siberia and northern Canada Remarkably, the stomachs of these animals contained warm weather plants, the implication being that the very ground upon which the animals grazed suddenly shifted from a temperature to from a temperate to an arctic climate. Hapgood and Einstein theorized that a sudden shifting and freezing of the continent of Antarctica, which may have been situated 2000 miles farther north than it is now, could have occurred as a result of crustal displacement. Interesting. I've heard a little bit about crustal displacement before. 
Ancient maps accurately depicting Antarctica before it was covered in ice also support the idea that the continent was situated in a temperate climate in recent prehistory. Copied from source maps of unknown antiquity, the Piri Reis map, um, Orentius Phineas, and Mercator maps derive Graham Hancock and the Flemaths propose from some prehistoric society with the capacity to calculate accurately longitude and and chart coastlines, an accomplishment that did not take place in recorded history until the 18th century. As outlined in the Flemaths and Hancock's books, the maps along with a body of evidence testify to the existence of a sophisticated prehistoric civilization. Charlton Heston narrating NBC's The Mysterious Origins of Man, likens this scenario to Plato's description of the lost continent of Atlantis. So just to pause there, um, since part of why I'm doing these readings is to discuss what I'm reading, but also um, because I am involved in the TTRPG community, um, I wanted to give people the opportunity to kind of brainstorm ideas they might get from these articles. So if you're talking about fantasy worlds, TTRPG, um, like Dungeons and Dragons, um, or for example, the uh, from Dungeons and Dragons, the Dragonlance um, world setting, they had a great cataclysm. Um, and I have not read all of the books and all of the literature on Dragonlance, so I'm not certain whether or not um, I really ever knew what caused the cataclysm. But what if in your world you want a cataclysm? Could you explain it by way of this crustal displacement um, or a comet impact, uh, an asteroid impact, uh, something like that? That could open up all kinds of um possibilities for why your world is the way it is i don't know anyway just a quick thought um if anybody has anything to add to that please type it in chat that's the point of this um this whole stream um uh, and it doesn't have to be about role-playing games it can be your actual thoughts on the theory the theories presented in the article so please just Bring it on. Okay, um, getting back to the reading. Lost civilizations, the real missing link? Question mark. Examining stonework at ancient cities in Bolivia, Peru, and Egypt, Hancock argues that these megalithic marvels could not have risen from the dust of nomadic hunter-gatherers, which is what conventional science would have us believe. The magnificent city of Teotihuacan Tiwanaku, Bolivia, said by the Bolivian scholar Arthur Poznanski, okay, uh, to date to 15,000 BCE, emerges as a case in point. Precision stone cuttings performed on immense blocks at Tiwanaku and at other sites to tolerances of one. 50th of an inch, and then the transporting of these blocks over long distances reveal technical capabilities that match or surpass those of modern engineers. And that's another um, interesting little tidbit there. He dated it at 15,000 BCE. The, um, what do they call it, the Clovis something or other? Um, which is the whole theory behind the Bering Land Bridge and coming across from Siberia into Alaska and down through Canada. That was supposed to be right around 15,000 years, between 13 and 15,000, depending on, and some as far back as, as, as uh, recently as 10,000 people say that that happened. Well, where the hell did this come from then if it's 15,000 years? old and it's all the way down in Bolivia. I mean, that's one of the problems I've had with the the um 
the prevailing theories of how people got to the Western Hemisphere. It's like they took a million years wandering around pre pre Homo sapiens, took a million years wandering around the African continent, and then another million years to finally wander out through Asia and Europe. And then they went from Siberia after 2 million years of wandering around, they went from Siberia into the, into the Western hemisphere, into Canada, modern day Canada, and all the way to the Southern tip of South America in like a thousand years. Really? Really? Took two million years to spread through Africa and Europe and only that long to... I mean, it's like they got there and they went, shit, it's cold, let's sprint to the south. I, I just don't buy that. That's why I've never agreed with those those theories. And I'm glad that they're, they're really being challenged now. Um, okay... Okay, surpass modern engineers. How supposedly primitive people transported these megaliths to the summit of Machu Picchu in Peru, for instance, remains a great mystery and is a feat that conventional science is at a loss to explain. Hancock asserts that even if we accept the latter dates most archaeologists ascribe to these structures, the knowledge and technical ability of the abilities of the builders would had to have been the product of a civilization that evolved over a long period of time, pushing the appearance of civilized man to the pre-dawn of recorded history. Quote, my view, Hancock says, is that we are looking at a common influence that touched all of these places long before recorded history, a remote third-party civilization yet to be identified by historians, end quote. A wide range of natural evidence and recorded human experience points to the existence of such a civilization. Etymology, the study of word origins, postulates that a prehistoric Indo-European language must have existed to account for the deep similarities in the world languages. Could this have been the language of Hancock's prehistoric civilization? Hamlet's Mill, an essay investigating the origins of human knowledge and its transmission through myth, written by MIT professor of science Giorgio de Santillana and University of Frankfurt professor of science Hertha von Deschend, Deschend is a study of how ancient myths depict the procession of the equinoxes. As such, as such, it weighs in on its common language issue also, also, testifying to the existence of advanced knowledge proliferated among prehistoric peoples, discussing myths that or, or, originate in the mists of antiquity and the numerical values and symbology recorded therein. Santayana and von Deschund uh, revealed that the ancients of many cultures shared a sophisticated knowledge of celestial mechanics, knowledge that has been matched only recently with the help of satellites and computers. <clears throat> the proliferation of closely related biological species <clears throat> on continents separated by vast oceans, a phenomenon that puzzles Darwinists, can also be explained by the existence of an advanced seafaring civilization in prehistory. An entire body of evidence, in fact, supports man and civilization having existed at a far earlier date than orthodox science or religion concedes is the case. Could the existence, then, of such a civilization be the real missing link in human history? Next section, why limit the debate to Western models? Hey, I think I said something like that just a minute ago. The conventional debate over our origins, as we find it characterized in the 
major media ignores concepts of human and cosmic origins that are shared by a large portion of the world's population, those of the mystic East. Einstein himself entertained such ideas because they supported his belief in a universal intelligence. More recently, the physicist and Nobel laureate Brian Josephson and others have drawn parallels between Eastern mysticism and modern physics. Fritjof Capra, in The Tao of Physics, harmonizes Vedic, Buddhist, and Taoist philosophy with the subtleties of quantum theory. The Vedas, in fact, present a scenario similar to the expanding and contracting universe of modern physics. The great in-breath and out-breath of creation, the projection of omnipresent consciousness, Brahman, the essence of which remains intrinsic to all things as creation evolves. I wonder if they'll get into the yugas. Uh, Taoism, on the other hand, offers an extent understanding of conscious reality that closely resembles Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, wherein perspective or consciousness shapes objective reality. To Einstein's reality, the awareness of a universal conscious presence inseparable from identity and creation became naturally apparent, as it does now to others in the fields of physics, philosophy, and religion. Quote, as I grow older, Einstein said, the identification with the here and now, his famous space-time, is slowly lost. One feels dissolved, merged into nature. The greatest minds then of our time and of the greatest antiquity reject Darwin, Darwin's often unstated premise, his belief in absolute materialism, which holds that all life evolved from primitive matter accidentally without purpose or design. At the same time, consciousness-based creation offers an alternative to strict biblical interpretations and the concept of an anthropomorphic creator separate from man and nature. Establishment science, though, has had a hands-off approach to consciousness, never daring to explore what, by definition, cannot be explained by matter-based beliefs about the origins of life. An article by David Chalmers in the December 1995 issue of Scientific American, The Puzzle of Conscious Experience, emphasizes the point. Quote, for many years, Chalmers says, consciousness was shunned by researchers. The prevailing view was that science, which depends on objectivity, could not accommodate something as subjective as consciousness, end quote. Chalmers goes on to say that neuroscientists, psychologists, and philosophers are only recently beginning to reject the idea that consciousness cannot be studied. He proposes, while insisting that consciousness is materially based, that, quote, it might be explained by a new kind of theory that will probably in involve new fundamental laws with startling consequences for our view of the universe and of ourselves, end quote. The eminent physicist Steven Weinberg, in his book Dreams of a Final Theory, puts it another way. He says the goal of physics is to develop a theory of everything that will tell us all there is, there is to know about the universe, a law or principle from which the universe derives. So stating, Weinberg exposes the limitations of scientific materialism while at the same time trying to dis transcend it as he butts up against an absolute a logos, if you will, that cannot exist within the context of material-based creation. The real problem, he admits, is consciousness, because it, it is beyond what could have derived from material processors alone. Darwinism, therefore, which depends upon the assumption that all existence is matter-based, cannot account for the most human characteristic of all, consciousness which cannot derive from the process of natural selection in a random mechanistic creation, the capacity of the human mind being far beyond what is necessary for mere survival. And strict creationism, when pitted against a Darwinism that ignores the origin of consciousness, along with other crucial factors, appears to be merely a foil that Darwinists use to make themselves look good. 
To understand human origins, then, and to develop a theory of everything, a true scientist must not only evaluate the tangible evidence presented in forbidden archaeology and in Hancock's Fingerprints of the Gods, he also must study consciousness, without which he neglects the most basic capacity of human beings, the ability to think creatively. He would have to experiment in the internal, subjective world, delving into what the scientific establishment considers a forbidden realm. He would have to devote himself, independent of any dogma, to the essence of his own conscious existence, as well as to the study of material creation. Like Einstein, he would see this pursuit as the essential goal of both science and religion, the search for knowledge in its purest sense, or seer in Latin, from which the word science derives. By so doing, science might arrive at a theory of everything. The end. <clears throat> so, how are we doing? We've been, ah, uh, 41 minutes. That's not too bad. Um, so, what did you all think of that article? Um, did you have any thoughts that you want to share? Um, anything at all? Even a, that sucked, or whatever. Just anything you want to add or or comment on as far as that that article um, like I said as far as um, role-playing games go I think the the idea of the uh, crustal displacement is a good one to explain a a catastrophe in your world as for our own real world um, it does explain some things. I don't think it's completely adequate in explaining everything, um, but it's certainly something that could be researched more. I'm not sure how they would ever figure that out, but um, there's a whole lot of the things that they come out with in geology, paleoanthropology, paleontology that I think they are really jump into conclusions based on very little evidence. Um, so I don't know. I think it would do, it would be really cool uh, and very helpful if some real established scientists would take the time to study um, Eastern philosophy and creation stories especially if they want to get into hinduism and its creation stories about um, brahma breathing the breathing out and and creating the universe breathing in and destroying the universe and every every inha inhalation exhalation is a new universe being created and destroyed um, i think that that would be uh, if they would look at that and the idea of the yugas um i think i'm pronouncing that right the are different ages different lengths of time measured in i in some of them in millions of years some parts of them in hundreds of thousands but it's all um it's actually really well detailed in a couple of hp blavatsky's books um which maybe one I want to get into pretty soon. Um, either The Secret Doctrine or Isis Unveiled, either one. It's like a thousand pages, so it'd be a, a long read, but I think it'd be very, very interesting, especially for this particular um, stream um, and what we're trying to do with it. Um, but anybody else have anything? Um, these videos will be going up on the YouTube channel. So if you are someone that is watching after the fact and you're watching on YouTube, please go ahead and leave comments because I'll still read those. Um, that's why I'm putting them on YouTube. So, um, yeah, go ahead and, and, and doesn't matter if it's 
five years from now, from the time I'm recording this, go ahead and leave your comments um, and give me your theories. Give me your ideas. <clears throat> okay, so let me see how many pages this next one is. Seven pages. Not even quite seven pages. Um, more like six and a quarter. I think I'll go ahead and read that one. Um, so that will finish up section one of this book. We'll get away from the creation um, evolution stuff and we'll get into the catastrophism stuff which is pretty interesting uh, subject as well so um, yeah actually before I do I'm gonna guzzle some water and try to give my voice a, uh, a break for just a minute and I will come back um, and We'll go ahead and read that next that next article since it's only six pages. So, all right. I will see you in a few minutes. Uh... Okay, hello, hello, hello. Welcome back. Need to remember to drink water more while I'm reading. <clears throat> Otherwise, it gets to my voice pretty quickly. But um, I will just go ahead and jump right into this last one in this section. And um, 
yeah, so this one is by J. Douglas Kenyon, who is the actual editor of this series of books. Um, so he also wrote for Atlantis Writhing. If I forgot to say that earlier, these books, Forbidden History, Forbidden Science, and Forbidden Religion, are three books that are compilations of articles from the magazine Atlantis Rising. Um, it's still available online, but it's not in hard copy. Uh, they don't print it anymore. Really interesting if you want to um, keep up with the brand new discoveries in archaeology and paleontology. They'll give little snippets um, before anything's available to the public You a lot of times. Um, and also just a lot of alternative theories. I mean, they'll have anything from time travel to Atlantis to Bigfoot to, you know, the Bosnian pyramids to, I mean, just all kinds of stuff all over the place. It's a pretty interesting magazine, and you don't have to take any of it seriously. It's just entertaining reading, if nothing else. Anyway, getting back into it. So, um... Exposing a Scientific Cover-Up, Forbidden Archaeology co-author Michael Cremo talks about the knowledge filter and other means of cooking the academic books by J. Douglas Kenyon. <clears throat> In 1966, respected archaeologist Virginia Steen McIntyre and her associates on a U.S. geological survey team working under a grant from the National Science Foundation were called upon to date a pair of remarkable archaeological sites in Mexico. Sophisticated stone tools rivaling the best work of Cro-Magnon man in Europe had been discovered in Huayatlaco, while somewhat cruder implements had been turned up at nearby El Horno. Horno? There's, uh, whatever. The sites... It was, uh, it was conjectured were very ancient, perhaps as old as 20,000 years. There's that dating, older dates again, which according to prevailing theories would place them very close to the dawn of human habitation in the Americas. Um, there have been some newer theories where they're pushing it back as far as like 40,000 years. Um, but anyway... Um, Steen McIntyre, knowing that if such antiquity could indeed be authenticated, her career would be made, set about an exhaustive series of tests using four different but well-accepted dating methods, including uranium series and fission track. She determined to get it right. Nevertheless, when the results came in, the original estimates proved to be way off, way under, as it turned out. The actual age of the site was conclusively demonstrated to be more than a quarter of a million years. As we might expect, some controversy ensued. Steen McIntyre's date not only challenged accepted chron chronologies for human presence in the region, but also contradicted established notions of how long modern humans could have been anywhere on Earth. Nevertheless, the massive re-examination of Orthodox theory and the wholesale rewriting of textbooks that one might logically have expected did not ensue. What did follow was the public ridicule of Steen McIntyre's work and the vilification of her character. She was not all, she has not been able to find work in her field since. And this was in 1966. More than a Century earlier, following the discovery of gold in California's Table Mountain and the subsequent digging of thousands of feet of mine, mining shafts, miners began to bring up hundreds of stone artifacts and even human fossils. Despite their origins in geological strata documented at 9 to 55 million years in age, California state geologist J.D. Whitney was able subsequently to authenticate many of the finds, and to produce an extensive report. 
The implications of Whitney's evidence have never been properly answered or explained by the scientific establishment, yet the entire episode has been virtually ignored and references to it have vanished from textbooks. I can tell you that one for sure. For decades, miners in South Africa have been turning up from strata nearly 3 billion years in age, hundreds of small metallic spheres with encircling parallel grooves. Thus, thus far, the scientific community has failed to take note. Among scores of such cases cited in Richard Thompson and Michael Kremel's Forbidden Archaeology and in its condensed version, Hidden History of the Human Race, it is clear that these three examples are by no means uncommon, suggesting nothing less than a massive cover-up. Kremel and Thompson believe that when it comes to explaining the origins of the human race on Earth, academic science has cooked the books. Though the public may believe that all the real evidence supports the mainstream theory of evolution, with its familiar timetable for human development, i.e. Homo sapiens of the modern type go back only about 100,000 years, Kremo and Thompson demonstrate that, to the contrary, a virtual mountain of evidence produced by reputable scientists applying standards just as exacting, if not more so, than those of the establishment has been not only ignored, but in many cases actually suppressed. In every area of research, from paleontology to anthropology and archaeology, that which is presented to the public as established and irrefutable fact is indeed nothing more, says Cremo, than, uh, quote, than a consensus arrived at by powerful groups of people, end, end quote. Is that consensus justified by the evidence? Cremo and Thompson say no. Carefully citing all available documentation, the authors produce case after case of contradictory research that has been conducted in the last two centuries. The authors describe astonishing discoveries made and then go on to discuss the controversies that ensued from those discoveries and the suppression of evidence that invariably followed. And that is something that we can see going on a lot, really, um, in, in many fields. The people that pay the bills decide what the truth is, whether it's true, true or not. Anyway, typical in the, is the case of George Carter, who claimed to have found at an excavation in San Diego, California, hearths and crude stone tools at levels corresponding to the last interglacial period and some 80 to 90,000 years ago. Even though Carter's work was endorsed by some experts, such as the lithic scholar John Whithoft, the establishment scoffed. San Diego State University refused to even look at the evidence in its own backyard, and Harvard University publicly defamed Carter in a course entitled Fantastic Archaeology. What emerges is a picture of an arrogant and bigoted academic elite interested more in the preservation of its own prerogatives and authority than the truth. I agree 100%. Needless to say, the weighty 952-page volume, Forbidden Archaeology, yeah, that's if you count the index and everything. It's actually um, 825 if you count just the text and the appendices. But still, um, another 75 pages of just index. That's a lot. Um, and um, bibliography. Needless to say, the weighty 952-page volume, Forbidden Archaeology, has caused more than a little stir. The establishment, as one might expect, is outraged, but is having a difficult time ignoring the book. The anthropologist Richard Leakey wrote, quote, your book is more humbug, is pure humbug, and does not deserve to be taken seriously by anyone but a fool, end quote. Nevertheless, many prestigious scientific publications, including the American Journal of Physical Anthropology, 
Geoarchaeology, and the British Journal for the History of Science have deigned the, to review the book. While generally critical of its arguments, they have conceded, although grudgingly, that forbidden archaeology is well-written and well-researched, and some indeed recognize a significant challenge to the prevailing theories. Good. As William Howells wrote in Physical Anthropologist, quote, to have modern human beings appearing a great deal earlier, in fact, at a time when even some primates did not exist as possible ancestors, would be devastating not only to the accepted pattern, it would be devastating to the whole theory of evolution, which has been pretty robust up until now, end quote. Yet despite its considerable challenge to the evolutionary edifice, Forbidden archaeology chooses not to align itself with the familiar creationist point of view, nor to attempt an alternative theory of its own. The task of presenting its own complex theory, which seeks, Cremo says, to avoid the false choice between evolution and creationism, usually presented in the media, Cremo has undertaken in another book entitled Human Devolution. On the question of human origins, he insists, quote, we really do have to go back to the drawing board, end quote. As the author told Atlantis Rising recently, quote, forbidden archaeology suggests the real need for an alternative explanation, a new synthesis. In human devolution, I've gone into that in detail. It's not element. It's got elements of the Darwin, Darwinian idea and elements of the ancient astronaut theory and elements of the creationist nature, but it's much more complex. I think we've become accustomed to overly simplistic pictures of human origins, whereas the reality is a little more complicated than any advocates of the current ideas are prepared to admit. Drink. <clears throat> Both Cremo and Thompson are members of the Bhaktivedanta Institu Institute. Oh, Bach okay, Bhaktivedanta. Uh, the Science Studies Branch of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. Oh, interesting. Cremo and Thompson started their project with the goal of finding evidence to corroborate the ancient Sanskrit writings of India, which relate episodes of human history going back millions of years. This is what I was talking about um, with the yugas and the, the different ages and the epochs. Uh, and at the end of each age, there's some kind of a catastrophe and then the next age starts. Um, again, kind of going back to the Dragonlance idea, the first, second, and third ages. I think that's all there were, three ages. Um, So, so we thought, uh, quote, so we thought, says Cremo, if there's any truth to those ancient writings, there should be some physical evidence to back it up, but we really didn't find it in the current textbooks, end quote. They didn't stop there, though. Over the next eight years, Cremo and Thompson investigated the entire history of archaeology and anthropology, delving into everything that has been discovered, not just what has been reported in textbooks. What they found was a revelation. Quote, I thought there might be a few little things that have been swept under the rug, end quote. Or, or, under the rug, said Cremo, but what I found was truly amazing. There's actually a massive amount of evidence that's been suppressed, end quote. Cremo and Thompson determined to produce a book of irrefutable archaeological facts. Quote, the standard used, says Cremo, meant the site had to be identifiable, there had to be good geological evidence on the age of the site, and there had to be some reporting about it, in most cases in the scientific literature, end quote. The quality and quantity of the evidence they hoped would compel serious examination by professionals in the field, as well as by students and the general public. Few would deny that they have succeeded in spectacular fashion. Much 
in demand in alternative science circles, the authors have also found a sympathetic audience among the self-termed sociologists of scientific knowledge, who are very aware of the failure of modern scientific method to present a truly objective picture of reality. The problem, Cremo believes, is both misfeasance and malfeasance. Quote, you can find many cases where it's just an automatic process. It's just human nature that a person will tend to reject things that don't fit in with his particular worldview, end quote. He cites the example of a young paleontologist and expert on ancient whale bones at the Museum of Natural History in San Diego. When asked if he ever saw signs of human work, human marks on any of the bones, the scientist remarked, Quote, I tend to stay away from anything that has to do with humans because it's just too controversial, end quote. Kremel sees the response to an innocent one from someone interested in protecting his career. In other areas, though, he perceives something much more vicious, as in the case of Virginia Steen McIntyre. Quote, what she found was that she wasn't able to get her report published. She lost the teaching position at the university. She was labeled a publicly publicity seeker and a maverick in her profession. And she really hasn't been able to work as a professional geologist since then, end quote. In other examples, Cremo finds even broader signs of deliberate malfeasance. His men he mentions the activities of Rockefeller Foundation, which funded Davidson Black's research in Jokudian in China. Correspondence between Black and his superiors with the foundation shows the, that research and archaeology were part of a far larger biological research project. The following is a quote from that correspondence. Quote, thus we may gain information about our behavior of the sort that we that can lead to wide and beneficial control. End quote. In other words, this research research Wow stumbling over my words. In other words, this research has been funded with the scientific goal with the specific goal of control. Control by whom, Cremo wants to know. The motive to manipulate is not so difficult to understand. Quote, there's a lot of social power connected with explaining who we are and what we are. End quote. Cremo says, somebody once said, knowledge is power. You could also say, power is knowledge. Some people have particular power and prestige that enables them to dictate the agenda of our society. I think it's not surprising that they are resistant to any change. End quote. Cremo agrees that scientists today have become a virtual priest class, exercising many of the rights and prerogatives that their forebearers in the industrial scientific revolution sought to wrest from an entrenched religious establishment. Quote, they set the tone and the direction of our civilization on a worldwide basis, he says. If you want to know something today, you usually don't go to a priest or spiritually inclined person you go to one of these people because they've convinced us that our world is a very mechanistic place and everything can be explained mechanically by the laws of physics and chemistry, which are currently accepted by the establishment, end quote. Drink. To Cremo, it seems the scientists have usurped the, the keys of the kingdom and then failed to live up to their promises. Quote, in many ways, the environmental crisis and the political crisis and the crisis in values is their doing, it, he says. And I think many people are becoming aware that the scientists really haven't been able to deliver the kingdom to which they claim to have the keys. I think many people are starting to see that the worldview they are presenting just doesn't account for everything in human experience, end quote. For Cremo, we are all part of a cosmic hierarchy of beings, a view for which he finds corroboration in world mythologies. Quote, if you look at all of those traditions, when they talk about origins, they don't talk about them as something that occurs just on this planet. 
There are extraterrestrial contacts with gods, demigods, goddesses, angels, end quote. And he believes there may be parallels in the modern UFO phenomena. The failure of modern science to satisfactory, satisfactorily deal with UFOs, extrasensory extra perception, and the paranormal provides one of the principal charges against it. Quote, I would have to say that the evidence of such today is very strong, he argues. It's very difficult to ignore. It's not something that you can just sweep away. If you were to reject all of the evidence for UFOs, abductions, and other kinds of contacts coming from so many reputable sources, it seems we have to give up accepting any kind of human testimony whatsoever. He has a good point. One area where orthodoxy has been frequently challenged is in the notion of sudden change brought about by enormous cataclysms versus the gradualism usually conceived of by evolutionists. Even though it has become fashionable to talk of such events, they have been relegated to the very distant past, supposedly before the appearance of man. Yet some individuals, like Emanuel Velikovsky, have argued that many such events have occurred in our past and induced a kind of planetary amnesia from which we still suffer today. I've been hearing that a lot, planetary amnesia. Um, that such catastrophic ep episodes have occurred and that humanity has suffered from some great forgettings, Cremo agrees. Quote, I think there is a kind of amnesia that when we encounter the actual records of cat catastrophes makes us think, oh, well, this is just mythology. In other words, I think some knowledge of these catastrophes does survive in ancient writings and cultures and through oral traditions. But because of what we because of what you might call some social amnesia, as we encounter these those things, we are not able to accept them as truth. I also think there's a deliberate attempt on the part of those who are now in control of the world's intellectual life to make us believe and forget the paranormal and related phenomena. I think there's a definite attempt to keep us in a state of forgetfulness about these things, end quote. It's all part of the politics of ideas, says Cremo. Quote, it's been a struggle that's been going on thousands and thousands of years, and it's still going on, end quote. And end article. That was that. So that really started to bring um, a few ideas together, I think. As far as, um, like I, I've mentioned, the yugas, um, you'd have to get into the Vedas to understand those. And I have not read the Vedas. I've only read excerpts and other people's um, commentary on them. Um, so I can't really speak to what the Vedas themselves actually say. But I do know that people talk about what they... They have different names for them, but they call them the yugas. And um, they are all of different lengths. Um, each age, each whatever, each span of time is of a different length. And they're, but they go in a cycle. They're like, I, th I think five, but I don't quote me on that. Um, and the like the last one I remember is called the Kali Yuga because um, Kali is the goddess of destruction in Hindu um, pantheon. So it's the final one where there's destruction. And that would be when Brahmin um, inhales and destroys the universe. Um, and then the exhale is a lot longer. It's millions of years, and it's the expanding of the universe over many, many millions of years. Um, whereas the destruction is pretty short, um, a few hundred thousand years. So anyway, uh, kind of interesting that they did that. Um, and that's another, again, 
Uh, you may not be here to talk about role-playing games, but that was part of why I wanted to do this, because I want to tie the two together. I want to study this kind of stuff and occult stuff with y'all, but I also want to talk about role-playing games with anybody that might want to do that. Um, so again, going to that, what a way to explain your universe, the inhalations and exhalations of the creator God, whatever you want to call it. You could just go with Brahmin um, if you wanted to, because um, why not? Um, but yeah, just another another thought on how you could use it in uh, content creation. Um, boy, it, it it's got my my mind going on on ways to use it. So um, anyway, that's it for tonight. Um, I am done reading. But I might not be done streaming. I will end this stream. But I'm thinking what I want to do is I might game a bit. Um, but we'll see. Um, I will catch you all in the next stream, whether that's in a few minutes or tomorrow night. If it's tomorrow night, it will be days gone. I don't even know what part we're up to. 20, maybe? 19 somewhere thereabouts um 19 yeah um long way into the game but i still don't know how far we have to go um tuesday is kingdoms of, of amalur and i think i'll be finishing the game that night um but yeah thank you all for coming um please like i said if you didn't want to leave a comment here when the video shows up online on YouTube, which is under Menace Gilglad as a as uh, the name of the channel, same as my Twitch and my Twitter and my TikTok and my everything, um, please leave your comments there. Get into this discussion, or if you don't want to share it with somebody else, send it to me in a direct message. Um, on whatever um, Twitch, you can whisper. Twitter, you can DM. Whatever you want to do, just send it to me, and I would be thrilled to discuss it with you. See you later.